and welcome to this conference hosted by MS Focus, the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation. I'm your host, Deborah Foreman, the Educational Programs Coordinator for MS Focus, and I'm joined by today by Dr. Aaron Boster, who's going to answer as many of your questions as he can within the next 60 minutes. Now I'm delighted to introduce him. Dr. Boster is a board certified neurologist specializing in multiple sclerosis and related central nervous system inflammatory disorders. He decided to become a multiple sclerosis doctor at age 12 as he watched his uncle Mark suffer from the disease in an era before MS treatment was available. Dr. Boster grew up in Columbus, Ohio and attended undergraduate school at Oberlin College. He earned his MD at the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine and completed his internal medicine and residency in neurology and clinical um, blah, 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 internship at the University of Michigan. He then completed a two-year fellowship in clinical neuroimmunology at Wayne State University. Since then, Dr. Boster has been intimately involved in the care of people impacted by multiple sclerosis. He's also been a principal investigator in numerous clinical trials, trained numerous multiple sclerosis doctors and nurse practitioners, and published extensively in medical journals. He lectures to MS patients and provides worldwide providers worldwide with a mission to educate, energize, and empower people impacted by multiple sclerosis. He lives in Columbus, Ohio with his son, Maxwell. Dr. Boster, we're so pleased to have you with us today. And once I give everyone some directions as to how to do their questions, um, we'll get back to you. So if you've never been with us before and you're not familiar with Zoom, this is how you do it. Um, if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment, you can do so by using the Q&A button in the app, which also allows you to send your question anonymously if you choose. You can even ask your question live by raising your hand. And to do that, you would just click the raise hand button or press star nine if you're on the phone, of course. I'll call on you and at which time you will unmute and ask your question. So let's see if we have any questions coming in. Hold on a second. I do have a couple that I'd like to. I see a hand raised from the audience as yeah. well. Let me do, I have several that came in through email, so I don't forget them. I'm going to do at least one right now. Absolutely. Uh, let's see. I am on Kisimta and need to transition to a medication that I can afford when I start Medicare. I'm only working for my insurance. I will not meet any of the copay assistance programs. Will I only have to pay $2,000 out of pocket since they are doing away with the donut hole? Can you educate me on this new process? I could be on the, I could go to the B cell depletion infusions and they are paid by Medicare Part A hospital insurance, but will still have to pay 20%, I'm told. I have done well on Kisimta, no insurance plans, I have found to cover Kisimta. Thank you. So first of all, Deb, thank you very much for having me back. I'm delighted to be here with you today. I've been looking forward to this all day while I was busy in clinic. So I'm grateful to be here. That is an unfortunately uh, common question. Uh, and the American healthcare system is such that th there's sometimes challenges in making ends meet. Uh, and I think a really good example is uh, government insurance, Medicare, will cover 20% of almost any drug, including most of the MS drugs. But the MS drugs, like cancer drugs, are crazy expensive. And so 20% of a really big number is still a really big number. And so that creates a lot of barriers. Now, uh, I can't solve the problem for the person who asked the question today, but I do want to throw out two ideas which maybe uh, they could discuss with their own clinician. The first one is to switch to a medicine that costs less than $8 a month. So many of you are familiar with the medicine Abagio, which is a branded medicine available for MS. It's a pill that you take once a day. And the nerd name, the real name of Abagio is teriflunamide, right? And there's no quiz. We're not going to play Scrabble later. Now, there's an old, old medicine that was invented for rheumatoid arthritis called Arava. And the real name of Arava is leflunamide. Now, when you take Arava and swallow it, the first metabolite is Abagio. Leflunamide turns into teriflunamide in your stomach. And so you can get 
Arava using GoodRx for $8 a month. And I have many, many patients when they have various barriers to access, we will do that. Easy breezy cover girl. And so that's one option to consider. Um, and I've talked to extensively with PharmDs and I guarantee that, that it's bioequivalent, which I really like knowing. So that's one potential option. Another option is to consider a discontinuous medicine. Kesempta is a fantastic medicine. It's a high efficacy medicine, but you need to take a shot every month forever. Now, discontinuous medicines are medicines that you take for a short period of time and then you don't take it anymore, right? And as an example, there's a medicine on the market called Mavenclad, a drug that I like very much. You take five pills the first month, five pills the second month, and then you're done for the year. And then on the second year, you do five pills the first month, five pills the second month, then you don't do it anymore. So imagine if you did the first year when you were uh, 63 years old, imagine that you did the second year when you were 64 years old, you enter at, into 65, switching on to Medicare, you're not on a medicine. You don't need to be on a medicine because you've been treated. Um, and so that's another style which can help someone to overcome these big barriers. So just two ideas to discuss with their own clinician. Thank you. Great answer. Um, we have David who raised his hand. So David, I'm going to allow you to talk. Go ahead. Howdy, and David. Yourself. You have to unmute yourself. Hi. Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Oh, good. Um, yeah. Hi. I'm calling from Golden, Colorado. Um, Anyway, um, so I just turned 60. I've been on Ocrevus for five years, um, uh, the B-cell B -cell depleting therapy. Um, and my doctor wants to move me on to Ocrevus. Um, and um, <laughs> mainly because my, my IG, my immunoglobulin G uh, numbers are low, but they've been consistently below range, not huge amount of below range, but just a, just slightly below range, but they've been consistent over the last five years. Um, I'm worried that if I go off the Ocrevus, that my EDSS is going to go down and I'm going to become a lot weaker uh, because of it. The, the Ocrevus gives me a lot of strength um, and energy. <laughs> it also wears down after the six month infusion. As I get six weeks or so out, I start to notice that I am getting uh, a little bit weaker. But my two questions uh, really are, um, is there anything else I can make a case for staying on it? And then two, if I do go off of it, is there a good substitute medicine for um, that will allow me to keep my strength? So um, great question, uh, very, very complex, appropriate question. I'm going to unpack it for everyone that's listening in. Uh, the, the medicine Ocrelizumab, Ocrevus, like Kesempta, is a high efficacy medicine. It's a real good one. It's an infusion given through the vein once every six months. Mm -hmm. And one of the potential side effects of Ocrevus, Ocrelizumab, is that it can lower the antibody levels and can increase the risk of infection. Right. And so there are some neurologists, I am not one of them, who feel that if you're a certain age uh, and the antibody levels are kind of low, that maybe the risk benefit is no longer in our favor and the better part of ours to come off. So I, I, my biased opinion is doctors do that way too quickly. And really, I think we need to look a little bit more. If you're antibody levels are low and you're not having any infections and you understand that there is a legitimate risk, I, Aaron, would not take you off the medicine because I don't feel like it's my right to be paternalistic and to tell you that you may or may not do something because it's your body. And for that matter, it's your insurance money. But, but what the doctor is attempting to do, pr presumably, is, is really protect you from infection. So, one of the things you could do is you could say, hey, doc, thank you so much for caring about me. I really appreciate that. I understand that you're trying to mitigate risk. I accept the risk. I haven't had an infection. My antibody levels have been okay. 
And I accept the risk that you're suggesting in exchange for the medicine. So I choose not to go off the medicine and it's my body, not your body. And it's my brain, not your brain. And it's my insurance, not yours. And so I am driving and I am telling you that this is what I think is right. All right. So, so that's one approach that you could take. Now, the second part of the question is, if in fact we have to come off, what do we switch to? And it's a very, very complex question, which would mandate a long discussion about all the things we've been on and all the things that are going on with you. I'll, I'll give a really simple answer. My last question, I can provide the same answer. One might consider what I refer to as de-escalation, where you go down a notch because as we age, the immune system quiets down and we want to mitigate risk. And so I will sometimes transition someone when I'm trying to de-escalate from a medicine like Ocrevus or Kesempta onto a maven clad or an abagio. So food for thought. And thank you very much for the question. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So we have an anonymous um, attendee who says, I have been Diagnosed with chronic gastritis two months after starting to Sabri. Can this be a side effect of the meds? And how does MS affect gastritis? No, uh, it doesn't. Okay. So I am not, I mean, Tysabri has been out since 2004, and I'm simply, I've used it a tremendous amount. Uh, I'm not familiar with it causing gastritis. Now, sometimes nature is too generous, and sometimes you can have MS and you can also have gastritis. Um, but I'm not familiar with a relationship. Thank you. Uh, Mary said the assistance fund may help. Mm -hmm. So that was for that other patient. Um, okay. So Angie says, what DMT are you giving to your patients with SPMS? I was on rituximab um, alternating with Lemtrada. I finished that six years ago. New lesions haven't appeared, but I'm gradually progressing, especially doing poorly with my balance and gait? So I think it's really, really important to keep in mind two things. Thing number one is if you have had relapses ever, you have a relapsing form of MS, period. As a human with MS ages, the likelihood of an attack decreases and the likelihood of getting worse via progression increases, but you still have a relapsing form of disease. The second important thing is the medicines that we use, the disease-modifying therapies, particularly the disease-modifying therapies, the newer ones, don't just treat attacks in new spots. They do treat brain volume and progression. So my first comment is I want you to keep on keeping on, all right? I, I wouldn't stop the medicine just because you've achieved a certain birthday or something like that. Um, what do I use? I, I use a lot of B-cell depletion in my practice. Um, I think that the data for progression is really solid. Um, and so uh, I, I really think that it's an individual discussion. But again, I want you to be a self-advocate. I want you to be a self-advocate because it's your body. And whether or not your doctor feels comfortable, in my mind, is kind of secondary because it's not, it's not your doctor's body. Um, and I think that you know, having been on Lemtrada and Ocrevus, you've been on very, very good drugs. And if you were having no difficulties in tolerating, let's say, Ocrevus, I don't see why I would stop. Thank you. And um, Jen has a question, so I'm going to unmute her. Go ahead, Jen. Hi, Jen. Hello. Hi, Hi. Dr. Bob. Can Jen? you hear me? You can hear? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. My question is, I'm a 47-year-old female. Um, very I was diagnosed... young. A very, very young female. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> I try. I'm um, older than you, and I'm very young, so you have to be like a baby. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so my question is, um, I was diagnosed with primary progressive a few months ago, and my MRI shows multiple lesions in the brain, including the pons and also the cervical spine. Mm -hmm. And um, I've had two lumbar punctures, which were both negative for OCBs, and uh, the IgG index was negative. And mm -hmm. so my doctor hasn't put me on um, the disease-modifying therapy, the specific therapy, but she has me on Cellcept, 
And I'm wondering, like, what do you? He said we'll test, we'll uh, test for the and we'll and count. we'll and we'll like monitor the white blood cell count and the liver function test because of the cell sept. But I'm I'm wondering, like, um, I know this is sort of non-standard therapy, but is is this a good approach? Do you think? So um, two caveats. Caveat number one is I don't have enough information to properly answer the question. Oh. And the second um, caveat is that I don't uh, intend to speak disparagingly about another clinician because I don't have enough information, but I would absolutely not do that. And I would get on a B cell depleter because when you study cell sep in MS, it's very, very poor data. And all it really did was maintain arm function. I'm not impressed with its efficacy. Whereas okay. the B cell depletion works exceedingly well, both in relapsing MS and in primary progressive MS. So my opinion is that's a style which uh, was done in the 80s, in the 1980s. And I think it deserves to be kept in the 1980s. And again, that's just my opinion. I'm not trying to speak poorly of someone else. Okay. Um, can you um, give me an example of a B cell depleter? Yeah, rituximab, ocrelizumab ufatumumab or ublituximab. Um, in English, rituxan, ocrevus, kesempta, and briumvi. Okay, she because she said that like with the OCBs being negative, she just wouldn't recommend going on a specific. Um, uh, so so doctors are like plumbers, right? <laughs> Um, and if you have a plumber that you really like, you keep hiring them, right? But if you have a plumber that you don't agree with, you just get a new plumber. Okay. Okay, thank you for your for your explanation. Uh, I it's just, just an, it's just an opinion. It it doesn't okay. make me right. It just makes me opinionated. Sure, <laughs> thank you. I'm I'm uh, her hobby doctor. Can thanks, I just Jen. add a little question, please? May I? Who are we talking to? I'm Jen's hobby. Oh, okay. Okay, the thing is, we're in Egypt right now, and mm -hmm. it's not easy to get our hands on on sp some meds. So I was wondering if the doctor would suggest something that may help until like we get back to the States. So rituximab is available um, ubiquitously throughout the Middle East. Okay. Um, and depending on your ability to travel, there are some centers of excellence um, in Abu Dhabi and in Dubai. Um, okay. And so, you know, I think that you do have some options traveling within the region. Um, but most Middle Eastern MS neurologists that I've interacted with do have access to rituximab at least. Okay. Okay. And, and, and we're actually considering going back to the States and Jen spends like searching and it's the, the, I was support. looking at like Duke university. I thought maybe they would have a good program. There's, because fortunately, there's a lot of good options um, uh, if you come over this direction. But that's okay. the one, and thank you both for the questions. Thank, thank you, you so much. Good, good luck. Wow, is there anything you don't know, Dr. Boster? Yeah, there's. I, I don't know most everything. Like, so oh for example, gosh. I have a complete lack of knowledge related to love or <laughs> politics or sports. But or you know what's going on in Egypt. I, lo I love it. There's. It's awesome. Just just as it relates to MS. Yes, I know. You're incredible. Okay, so let's go to the next one. Um, Angie's asking, what DMT or which DMT are you giving to your patients with SPMS? We I did that question. We did that question. Yep. Oh, yep. Okay. Um, let's go on to Tracy. Um, our son is 19 and has been on Casimta for not quite a full year. He seems to qualify for a program that doesn't cost him much or anything. I'm guessing because he doesn't work. He is, he is a high school grad and tried college for a semester, not working, um, going to school now. How do, how long do programs like that usually last? So again, an excellent question. Um, there, when uh, when someone is applying to receive assistance for a disease-modifying therapy in the United States, they typically do a wallet biopsy. And if the human doesn't have uh, extravagant resources, then fortunately, the uh, many of the, um, the manufacturers have assistance programs. And they reevaluate the assistance programs every year. And so presumably, if your 19-year-old son becomes 20, and a year has gone by and he's still a student and he's still not uh, gainfully employed, making, you know, hand over fist money. 
he's going to apply he's going to apply and be approved the same way he was the year before um you know i i think that it's probably very viable that he will gain access this way um i'm going to be uh i'm going to be um controversial for a second and i'm going to suggest if there was a point in time when he wasn't able to gain access he consider a clinical trial now i'm not ever suggesting a clinical trial with a placebo i'm i'm suggesting consideration to a clinical trial where you're on drug a or drug b and those are the kind of situations where you know the manufacturer covers the cost of the medicine and the mri and the lab and the doctor's visit and all the things and Oftentimes, they even pay the participant a small stipend. But the important part is that he's guaranteed to be on a drug, one or the other. Now, is that necessary right now? Absolutely not. But I do think that it's a very viable option to consider if that were ever to become a problem. Thank you. Karen says um, her question is regarding Ocrevus. She's been on in this for five years, and her legs are always heavy and restless. She also has increased brain fog and exhaustion. Do you believe this can be from Ocrevus? The symptoms have increased as time goes on with Ocrevus. So I think it's very, very unlikely to be related to the medicine. I think, unfortunately, it's much more likely to be related to the underlying disease. So uh, multiple sclerosis is a condition where you can develop disability or problems from two different causes. You can have an attack, God forbid, where you don't fully recover. Right. And so then you accrue a degree of neurological disability. I'll give you an example. If your um, leg became weak and you couldn't walk because of an attack and then it healed, but you had a hitch in your giddy up, it's not as strong as it used to be. And so we call that relapse associated worsening. That's what we call that. There's a second way that you can have trouble. And that second way is, is called progression independent from relapse activity or PIRA, P I R A. And what I'm hearing is very likely Pira. Now, medicines like Ocrevus can slow down both, but they don't do Pira as well as they do raw. And so even on the most effective medicines with MS, if we look very carefully, we can see some slippage. And that is more likely to be coming from the underlying disease as compared to the actual medicine itself. Thank you. Um... Let's see. We had somebody who was going to ask a question, but she's not there anymore. So let's go to the next. Thoughts about HSCT? So HSCT stands for hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, right? And it's not a medicine. It's a procedure. So, so it's also not approved for multiple sclerosis in the United States. It's only available in the United States via research. Uh, the procedure is extremely intense. And uh, what we do with the stem cell transplant is we remove stem cells and put them on ice so they don't die. And then we murder the human being. We literally give lethal doses of chemotherapy and we permanently destroy their immune system. So they no longer have an immune system, zero. And if we did not intervene, they would succumb to infection. Like even a cold would kill them. But before they die, we give them back the stem cells. And what's academically interesting is these stem cells are not what helps the MS. The stem cells just prevent you from dying. It's the destroying the immune system. It's the chemo that helps the MS, right? Now, stem cell transplantation is not prime time in the United States. As I mentioned, it's still uh, in the context of research. There are some places around the world, like in Great Britain, where if you have extremely aggressive MS, then you can qualify for a stem cell transplant through their government programs. Right now, um, I think that in the United States, stem cell transplantation is exciting from a research standpoint. I think it deserves to be studied extensively. I think that it may one day become prime time, but it isn't yet. And whenever I talk about hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, I want to rem remind people to be cautious of stem cell tourism. So there are situations where you can travel to an exotic location like India or Mexico or Chicago and give somebody a bunch of money and they'll swap out your bone marrow. And I think that there's a, there's a lot of concern surrounding the safety and the ethics of that. 
And so we want to be very, very cautious. Thank you. Karen says, what is the date for progression with Mavenclad? What is the, I'm not exactly sure that I understand the question, but what I'm going to interpret the question as to date, what is the information on, um, on progression on people that take Mavenclad? So let's assume that was the question. And if we look at the clinical trials data, it gives us some very encouraging information. Now, there's a lot of discussion surrounding statistics, but setting that aside for a second, when we gave people Mavenclad and then we followed them for 10 years, 60% of the people that we tracked never got treated again. So they went year two, three, four, five, six, they went for a decade and they never got treated again. Is it guaranteed that that happens to everyone that takes Mavenclad? Absolutely not. But knowing that it's a possibility is extremely exciting. Um, and so um, I have found Mavenclad in my own practice to be a, a rather lovely medicine that I enjoy using. Um, and I think it does a decent job at helping with progression. That's my experience. Thank you. Um, Alyssa is saying, I have PPMS and doctors took me off Ocrevus because I got too many UTIs and landed in the hospital twice last year. Mm -hmm. Now I am not on any DMT, feeling a little worried. I'm already in a wheelchair. So again, we're, we're visiting this risk benefit, which is so critical and so at the center of decisions in medicine. Um, being hospitalized for urinary tract infection ain't no joke. Uh, and I'm so sorry that happened to you. And obviously, we don't want to do something to precipitate more infections. That stated, um, uh, being a young human and having PPMS and already being in a wheelchair, you, you probably don't want to get any worse. And so I, I think that there are some considerations. So one consideration is to take Maven, excuse me, we were just talking about, to take Ocrevus, but less often. So take the Ocrevus once a year, and presumably that would allow your B cells to return a little bit and to be able to fight infections. A second thing is to be very, very aggressive about uh, prophylaxing against urinary tract infections. So I will sometimes give patients a bottle of antibiotics and they take a pill after intercourse or they could, sometimes they take a pill every evening. Sometimes they have intercourse every evening. And, and so what we're doing is we're being very, very proactive in trying to treat um, urinary tracts and prevent them from occurring. Um, there are some other off-label options for PPMS, but that's really kind of getting into the stratosphere of thoughts. And so I, I, I would consider, is there a way that we could decrease that risk? For example, uh, one more example, if the Ocrevus made your IgG levels go low, then the doctor could give you Ocrevus and uh, IVIG, both. And the IVIG would push the antibodies up, you wouldn't have infection, and the Ocrevus would keep the PPMS at bay. So uh, there's many different ways to skin a cat, so to speak. And I, I wouldn't accept as a foregone conclusion that you cannot have further therapy, because I think you probably can if it takes six to 12 months to replenish your B cells, is it possible off label to only take a symptom every two to three months and still do well with less of the drug? So I think, I think the question is, um, is, can you get away with doing it less frequently? And the answer is yes, you probably can. Now, when, when we use a medicine, I like to use a medicine the way it was developed because that's where all the data exists. So that way I can look in the eyes and say, here's what I expect, here's what I don't expect. So we have not studied B cell depleters given less frequently, but I certainly have done it in clinical practice in various situations. And I do think that it is an option. Wendy says, what IgM level is too low to continue with rituximab? Zero, it doesn't matter. Um, IgM is irrelevant. So, so let's be nerdy for a second and talk about uh, immunoglobulins. Okay, so, so you hear about this IgA, IgG, IgM, all these Igs, right? And immunoglobulin is simply a doctor word for antibody. And IgA antibodies have to do with allergies and we don't care. IgG antibodies have to deal with the memory. So memory antibodies. So if you had chicken pox when you were seven, you have IgG antibodies against chickenpox. Those we want to be up there. 
IgM, which is the question, IgM is the antibody which develops when you have an acute infection. So if you get an infection, IgM goes up. Now, we have known for a long time that B cell depleters decrease IgM and has zero clinical bearing, none. And so I don't care what your IgM level is. And if you have a low IgM level, you, you, you know, and that's reflective of the fact that you don't have an infection, good job. So I don't find there to be a number where I ever care. Thank you. Could you please explain the MS hug and the best ways to deal with it? Yes. So, so when I was in medical school, uh, my professor told me that MS did not cause pain. And that's complete hogwash. That's false. Um, in fact, MS causes all kinds of different unique forms of pain. And one of the most nasty is something that we oftentimes call the MS hug. Now, the MS hug is the only hug you don't want. And it's typically uh, described as a lasso around the waist crushing you or putting on a bra that's eight times too tight or um, being hugged by a bear and, and literally being squeezed. Now, what happens is that there's a lesion typically in the spinal cord. And the spinal cord sends a message to the muscles between the ribs. Now, I'm going to be gross for a second, but I really love barbecuing and smoking meats, and I enjoy making barbecued ribs. And the meat that we're eating is called the intercostal muscles, and humans have them just like cows. And when that, that lesion in the spinal cord sends a fake message, it causes the meat between the ribs to contract. And so literally, you are being squeezed by your own muscles. Now, it's exceedingly painful. Um, oftentimes, people, the very first time it happens, end up in the emergency department because they are concerned that they're having a heart attack, God forbid, or something like that. Um, and it, it can be the bane of many people's existence. Fortunately, there's a bunch of things that we can do to treat it. The, the primary way to treat it is to use medicines which stabilize neuronal cell membranes, like anti-seizure drugs. So a seizure is an electrical storm on the surface of the brain. And the medicines to treat seizures, like Tegretol, that's a medicine which stabilizes the membranes of the cells. And it doesn't just do it in the brain, it does it in the spinal cord. And so when someone has a MS hug, we can use anti-seizure medicines to stabilize it to help them. There are many other things that we can do uh, beyond that, but that's where we start. And I would simply tell you that you do not have to live with MS hug, that it can be very effectively treated. If you go see your neurologist and they say, mm -hmm, then say, that's fine. Now send me to someone who can treat it because I'm not living with this pain. Send me to a specialist who can deal with this kind of thing, maybe a pain specialist uh, or something else. But I don't want you to, to just decide that you have to live with it because it's very, very unpleasant. Thank you. Um, this is a, the gentleman that's living in uh, Greece who wrote in, which DMTs do not, or at least, well, which DMTs do not, or at least have the least effect on the liver? I have fatty liver grade two. And then what is the definition of highly active MS? Well, I so guess so a complex question. Let's try to take each part uh, in order. And so the first question is related to MS disease modifying therapies and specifically the way they're metabolized. So certain medicines are metabolized by the kidneys. Certain medicines are metabolized by the liver. Certain medicines are not metabolized. They're catabolized. They dissolve in the bloodstream. And it's very relevant that if someone has a liver damage, we don't want to give them a medicine which causes more liver damage. So, so several medicines would be shied away from in that situation, particularly the interferon medicines, interferon beta medicines. So that'd be like Extavia, Plegarty, Rebif, uh, Avonex, those kind of medicines we would shy away from because they're metabolized by the liver and they can raise the liver enzymes. Same thing with the S1P1 receptor modulators. So that would be like Gelinia and Zaposia um, and, and Ponvori and uh, uh, medicines like that, because they're metabolized by the liver and they can raise liver enzymes. Now, the 
uh, the, the oral agents like Tecfidera vumerity, they also can be metabolized by the liver as can the abagio and the mavenclad. So I just listed all the pills. So, so now we're kind of wondering, okay, well, what's left over? Well, the B cell depleters are, so the B cell depleters are medicines like Ocrevus, Briumvi, Pisemta, and Rituximab. Those are not metabolized. They do not, they're not processed by the liver. They're catabolized, they dissolve in the bloodstream. And so I have used them uh, very frequently when someone has a liver problem. Um, as long as they don't have like a liver infection, then we can do that. Tysabri is metabolized by the liver, but I don't find it has a very significant impact in liver. Um, and so I wouldn't worry too much about that. Uh, the only medicine that I haven't spoken about in the armamentarium is Limtrata, but Limtrata can impact the liver in a couple different ways. So I would really gravitate towards the monoclonal antibodies like the uh, B cell depleters. And if those didn't work, then I would consider Tysabri. I also want to point out that fatty liver can be um, addressed uh, in some cases by diet. So a diet that is really, really low in sugar can decrease fatty liver quite a bit. And we can track fatty liver by checking labs. And so if we needed to treat the MS, which sounds like a really good idea, we could put someone on a medicine and then we could follow the liver enzymes to make sure that they don't go crazy. Thank you. Stefano is um, asking, is it fair to say that Kasimta and Ocrevus are among the most effective DMTs in the market right now? Are you yes. seeing slowing down of the disease? Yes. Thank you. Okay. And David is asking, when I work out or walk too far, I get a slight fever and the next day sometimes, uh, or they get a fever the next day. Sometimes he's tired and has tightness in his stomach. It's a lot like the flu or COVID. How can I know the difference? So in order to live your best life, despite having MS, I need you to exercise as part of your lifestyle, which is very easy for me to say. It's very hard for us to do, right? I mean, I'm sitting on my duff telling you to go exercise, but it's really, really important. And MS is sometimes rather unfair because MS can make your legs weak. And MS can make it really hard to stay in shape, which makes you deconditioned. So you kind of sometimes have a double whammy. The reality is that we must find a way to exercise as part of your lifestyle. And my one strong suggestion, I'll, I'll give two, is we want to do it very, very slowly. So I want you to go for a walk short enough that the next day you don't have a fever and feel like, you know, death warmed over. Now, in the beginning, that walk may be five minutes. That's it, all right? But I want you to have a successful walk and then the next day not be ill. When you can do that every single day without a problem, I want you to go to six minutes. Now, notice what I did there. I didn't say 10 or 15. I said I went from five to six. Very, very slow incremental change can be helpful. I also want to point out the success that you can have in water. So water is darn near magic in the setting of multiple sclerosis mm. and exercising in the water is phenomenal because if you get overheated, the water wicks away the heat by convection. If you fall this way, the water pushes back that way. If you are walking with the weak left leg, you weigh less in the water. And so you can do things in the water that you can't do on land. And so one of the very uh, favorite ways that I suggest you exercise is to do anything in the pool, anything at all, walk laps. Um, and I hope that helps get you on the right path. Thank you. Daniel says, I've been diagnosed as being SPMS after 11 years as relapsing remitting. I'm, all, I'm also diagnosed with utic uticral vasculitis. Um, I, I can't see the question. Um, and so I'm assuming, okay, let's, but let's um, keep going. Okay. Uh, it's U-T-I-C-A-R-I-A-L, uh, vasculitis. Urticarial vasculitis. Okay. Do you know of a medicine that helps with both of these conditions? I have not been on a disease modifying in a couple of years since we have been focusing on the UV. Got it. Um, 
I'm I'm confused about the diagnosis, and I'm not sure if they're talking about uveitis or uh, a vasculitis in, in the in the eyes. Uh, and, yeah. and so I'm going to pass on answering the question because I don't understand. I don't want to give out uh, the wrong advice. Uh -huh. um, what I will say is that very frequently a neurologist specializing in MS and a rheumatologist or an ophthalmologist who specializes in that form of vasculitis, we partner up and then we find combinations of therapies that work. As an example, I very frequently co-manage people that have both MS and psoriatic arthritis or, or have like rheumatoid arthritis or something like this. And what we'll do is we'll use combination medicine. I'll put them on something and the rheumatologist will put them on something and then we play nicely in the sandbox. And so I would encourage a collaboration as you try to figure it out. And Stephanie's asking, what do you tell someone who isn't sure that their DMT is working? Every time she's out and about extensively, uh, she gets sick. She's um, been on Okravis since 722 and do now. So I think what I would tell them is we have to revisit the expectations of the disease modifying therapy. So if you, uh, t if you have three children and you start oral birth control, you still have three children. They don't go away, right? And if you want to know why you're taking oral birth control, go hang out with your three children. I'm teasing. But my point here is birth control doesn't remove uh, a past event, birth control prevents an unplanned future event, in this case, a pregnancy. MS disease modifying therapies are birth control pills against future MS disease activity. So if you have accrued a degree of neurological disability with fatigue or with weakness or with vision or whatever, and you start an MS disease modifying therapy, the expectation, unfortunately, is not that that's going to get better. That's caused by brain damage, which has already occurred. We're taking the MS medicine to prevent a new event from occurring. And understanding that expectation is very, very, very important. Because if you didn't understand that, then you might think that if you have symptoms, then the drug's not working. When you treat multiple sclerosis, there's really three parallel paths. Treating an attack if it occurs, which is not what you're talking about, treating an, the, the disease with a disease-modifying therapy to slow it down, and treating symptoms which erode the quality of your life. And so it's not one, it's all three. I hope that helps. Thank you. Um, Sarah says that ex, um, is exercising with electromuscle stimulation helping when you exercise? So exercise is super, super important. Uh, and what you're talking about is like a TENS unit or like a E-STEM. Uh, and I think those can be really, really cool. Uh, one of the things that we have to keep in mind is when someone with MS exercises, there's oftentimes not very much carryover from one form of exercise to the other. And so you might learn to exercise with an E-STEM and be able to do certain things with the E-STEM, but you can't do it without the E-STEM. And so what I would recommend or what I recommend when someone's using an assist device like that is I would do about half of the exercises without it. And then I would do half the exercises with it. And that way I'm getting the benefit of the e-stim, but I'm also training without it. And I think both are important. Thank you. Um, this person says that they've been told that their MS is at moderate level. Can you explain what that means and how quickly can that progress? They have RRMS. So I would submit to you that no neurologist can actually answer that. I don't think that there isn't like levels, like you have a level seven or like stages like cancer. There are prognostic factors which can predispose one human to have a more or less aggressive time of it. And if you have any of those prognostic factors, um, I am of the opinion that we need to push to try to have a zero tolerance policy, because if we allow brain and spinal cord damage, we can't give it back. So I dislike when I hear a neurologist say something to the tune of, oh, honey, it's not that bad. I mean, I really, it really gets me kind of upset. So for example, 
If the only problem you have is that you've lost coordination in your non-dominant hand, well, what if you like to play the guitar? What if you like to masturbate with that hand? What if you play basketball? What if you use that hand for something that you enjoy? Well, that's not minor, that's major. And so I dislike when doctors uh, say something to the effect of, oh, it's just moderate, we don't have to worry about it too much. To me, that sounds like a cop-out. Now, again, I'm just being very open and honest about my bias, but I don't believe in the concept of benign multiple sclerosis and I don't want you to accrue any neurological disability. And so whether it's moderate or not, I think we have to push really hard to prevent bad things from occurring in the future. Thank you. And we have a gentleman by the name of Hassam. It says, it's Hassam, doctoral researcher from Melbourne. Could you please give some insight of personalized therapy versus generalized therapy? So it's very popular these days to talk about personalized medicine, the idea that we would develop and craft a very specific medicine for a specific person at a specific time. That sounds like super good. And we're not there yet. Um, and so I think generalized medicine might be like everyone in my clinic gets the same drug. I use drug blank. And when you come into my clinic, that's what you get. Uh, and unfortunately, there used to be doctors like that who treated MS. I think what we attempt to do now is we attempt to risk stratify based on uh, prognostic factors, and then we gravitate towards more effective medicines in those people that have higher risk, which, by the way, I completely disagree with. I think that we should use the most effective medicines that exist for all patients because we can't predict the future and know who's going to go on to have problems or not. Now, the real personalized medicine doesn't exist yet. And that would be to re-describe the disease, not with a phenotype of like relapsing MS or something, but based on the immunology and the genetics, where we would draw labs, look at your genes, look at your immune profile, and then based on that, craft a therapy. And that is not available yet. That's not something which we can do outside of highfalutin research. Thank you. Bertina says that she's had MS and lupus and lost her taste and smell in 2020 with COVID. Are you aware of any treatments to restore that? Tincture of time. Uh, we see this a lot with long COVID. Uh, and I've had patients that literally couldn't taste for like two years. Um, now, fortunately, many of them are now starting to get the taste back. Uh, but tincture of time is the only thing that I'm aware of that can help. I'm sorry. I wish I had something better to say. Jen said um, she has PPMS and have, has lost sensation and some motor function from the waist down. Gabapentin doesn't really help with the lower limb neuropathy. Is there any other option to treat the neuro neuropathic pain as it's constant and interfering with sleep? 100%. Um, so if you picked a number between one and 40, I bet you I could come up with that number of neuropathic pain treatments. There's a lot, a lot of treatments for neuropathic pain. So we can use off-label antidepressants to treat neuropathic pain like Pamela or, or uh, Elevil. We can use anti-seizure medicines the way that I talked about earlier. And there's like 20 of them. Uh, we can, there, there, and that's what gabapentin is. Gabapentin, Neurontin, is an example of an anti-seizure medicine. And there's a bunch of other ones like Lyrica, which you may have heard of, or Lamictal, which you may have heard of. There's a whole host that we can use. We can use um, medicine by Edison and spinal cord stimulators can help tremendously with neuropathic pain from spinal cord involvement. Uh, I've had grand success with some people with neuropathic pain being treated that way. We can use intrathecal pain pumps where we uh, implant a very small pump inside the body, which delivers medicine to the thecal sac. And we can use very special medicines to manage neuropathic pain that way. There are a host of things that can be done. You should not, in my opinion, accept that you have to hurt. And again, if your neurologist is not comfortable, they're allowed not to be comfortable, but they should then refer you to a pain expert, not to receive a narcotic because that won't work, but to look into some of these other um, ways of managing pain. Thank you. Julie is asking, would you recommend HSCT for non-responders of DMTs? So 
I think it depends on what you mean by, by non-responder. If you have failed a medicine, absolutely not. If you have failed two medicines, absolutely not. If we're dealing with an extreme case where I've given you three or four rounds of Lintrata and previously had Rituxan or Ocrevus, um, and things are still very, very inflammatory, maybe. Um, what I want you to take away from my answer is the vast majority of, of Americans should be treated with high effective medicines long, 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 long before there's any discussion about whether they need a stem cell transplant. That's, again, my opinion. Thank you. Karen says, what MS medication in the future pipeline are you most excited about? Particularly any, um, let's see, any that are not immune suppressing. So there are two categories of medicines that are being developed right now that I'm excited about. Excuse me. One of them are called the brutine tyrosine kinase inhibitors or BTK inhibitors. These are little pills that were invented originally to treat cancer um, back in like the late or the early 90s. And they have been studied in MS and found to be very effective early on. And so we're doing big clinical trials studying them right now. So at the Boster Center, we are doing five clinical trials looking at these various BTK inhibitors. We're studying them in primary progressive MS, in secondary progressive MS, and in relapsing MS. One of the reasons I'm excited about BTK inhibitors is they suppress B cell discussions. So talking amongst B cells without murder. So they don't deplete the B cells, which by the way, is a really great way of treating MS, but they, but that creates immunosuppression. They block the B cell signaling so they can't hear like, la, 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 I can't hear you. And that way you can interrupt the condition, the MS, without increasing the risk of infection. The other thing that BTK inhibitors can do is they can cross the blood-brain barrier inside the central compartment, and they can turn off a cell, which we know is active in MS, a cell called microglia that we've never been able to reach before. And now with this medicine, we can turn it off. So that's very exciting. Yeah. There's a second category of medicine, which is farther down the pipeline, but we're now starting to enroll patients. Um, and these medicines are called anti-CD40 ligands. What a crazy set of words, anti-CD40 ligands. And anti-CD40 ligands interfere with B cells communicating with T cells, but they don't murder either. They just make it so they can't talk. And these medicines also look very attractive because they don't increase risk of infection. And so I'm very excited about both of those, which are currently being developed. And we're studying both of them at my center. Thank you. Do you recommend an MMR vaccine since it is a live virus? So there's a general idea that we want to avoid giving people uh, with MS live vaccines. There's a theoretical concern that it could trigger an attack. But when you really look at the data, the only one that really suggests like legit increased risk of attack is yellow fever. Yeah. So if you, you know, if you have not received MMR, I mean, measles, mumps, rubella can kill you. Uh, and so I think it's a really good idea to be immunized. And I wouldn't shy away from that. I also want to share with you that earlier last year, I was in South America uh, working with a bunch of MS neurologists in South America. And this discussion of immunization came up and I shared how I was nervous about giving yellow fever vaccine and everyone in the room. And there was probably about 200 neurologists laughed at me. And they all said, we give it routinely here in South America because yellow fever will kill you. And so they routinely immunize their MS patients. So the short and the long of it is, I think we make a big to do about something which is not that relevant bluntly. And I, in this case, I would err on the side of being vaccinated. Thank you. Um, Stephanie's asking, because her doctor thinks she may be having seizures, how do seizures affect MS? So a seizure is an electrical storm on the brain, right? So the brain communicates using electricity. And if there's an area of the brain that builds up an electrical signal, it can build up and build up and then, and it can cause the brain to fire inappropriately. And seizures are very common, interestingly, in the setting of MS. So people impacted by MS are six times more likely to experience seizures compared to the general population. Um, and a seizure isn't always like on TV. 
So on TV, when someone has a seizure, they fall down and they shake and they froth and stuff like that. And that's very, very, very uncommon as a presentation for seizure. What's more common is during the electrical storm in the brain for 30 seconds or a minute, you're not online. So if you, I'm sitting there talking, and then I start back up again, where I'm literally like offline for a while. And after the event, which typically lasts 30 to 90 seconds, the person can be confused for days. And so that is a, called a complex partial seizure, uh, where someone is just offline. Um, they may even be moving around. They may even be talking a little bit, but they're not making sense and they're not really taking in information. Now, the important thing to keep in mind is seizures are relatively easy to diagnose and they're relatively easy to treat. Most seizures that I treat are easily managed with only one anti-seizure medicine. Thank you. Um, this is another question that came in online. How do you weigh the risk benefit with a disease modifying therapy when you've already been burnt by a previous DMT? And I mean burnt, not with a new relapse or a new lesion, but the DMT not being safe anymore. I chose so, a safe DMT. Whoops, do you want me to read the whole thing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I chose a safe DMT plegrity with interferon having having long safety records, my liver enzymes six times upper limit. Whatever DMT I choose now is higher efficacy, but also less safe. My EDSS is one. I have no cognition issues and none of the many symptoms many people discuss, such as fatigue, foot drops, heat sensitivity, bladder, et cetera. It's difficult to make a wise decision. So a couple of things that we have to keep in mind. The fact that you had a bad experience on one medicine has zero bearing on the experience you'll have with another medicine, not related, right? So if I flip a coin and I get a tails, my next coin flip has a 50% chance. The tails I had before has nothing to do with the new coin flip. And so even though emotionally it stinks to have taken plegarity with a plan of it being very safe and then have a bad thing happen, it has no bearing on what may happen next. The second thing which I implore you to consider pretty please is we must, we must place the risk benefit of the medicine inside the context of the risk of the disease. I am delighted that presently you don't have any of those symptoms. Untreated, you will. And we're not putting you on a disease modifying therapy to help you today, right? We're putting you on a disease modifying therapy so that 30 years from now, you're living your very best life. And 30 years from now, you have not accrued disability. And so if we were to channel the 30 years from now you to the table with you, that person would use very strong language to demand that you pick a medicine and that you try to make it work so that you can preserve the neurologic reserve. You can maintain the brain. Very, very important. I, I think that it's reasonable, it's rational to say, hey, look, I had a bad experience. I'm a little gun shy. But I also think it's rational to, to sit down and talk through the risk benefit of that new medicine and then to make the best educated guess that you can. Because we are not going to be successful long term if we don't treat this disease. Thank you. Brittany um, wrote some things down that she has a very extensive question and it was sent online. I didn't get it, but she's asking if that can be, if we don't address it now, could I send it to you for your comments? Um, so can I do that afterwards or sure. do you want to wait until the next one? <laughs> um, you know what? I mean, we'll, either one. We'll, we'll figure it out one way or the other, you and I. We can do that later, Deb, and, okay. and we'll, we'll go through it. Good enough. Um, okay. So Joe Marie says, I take Casimta. My bilirubin numbers have been going up. Uh, let's see, been going up. You said Casimta isn't metabolized in the liver. So can I rule out that Casimta could be contributing to the elevating numbers? Again, I don't have enough information. I can't give you specifics to you. I was simply sharing that the way that B cell depleters work is they're not metabolized or chewed up. Now, the average person with MS is on seven medicines. And so if you, like other Americans with MS, are on other medicines, some of those may be impacting the liver. And so I think at the end of the day, we have to do a search and try to figure it out. 
Um, I think that it's less likely to be related to Q-Symptom, like but again, I don't have enough info in front of me to be able to help you adequately. And your opinion on effectiveness of glutiramir acetate. I am 65, took glutiramir acetate for about 15 years until I wasn't sure if it was working. Been off all DMTs for seven months. Feel the need to start up on a DMT due to noticeable progression. MRIs have been stable. Any suggestions? So something is a lot better than nothing, right? So, so being on any disease-modifying therapy has some benefit as compared to being on no disease-modifying therapy. Now, as you may have gleaned, I'm very biased, and I, I strongly encourage people to take DMTs. When we stop DMTs in people that are, quote, older, end quote, about a third go on to have progression of disability, and I don't like that very much, and it sounds like that may be the situation you're in. So if your comfort level is to go back on the drug that you took for 15 years, God bless, right? Is Copaxone, glutamor acetate, the most effective drug for progression? No, it's not. Can it slow progression? Some. Is it a lot better than being on nothing? Absolutely. And so again, the theme of this discussion today really is the risk benefit assessment, which changes over time. I would love to sit down with you and then say, okay, what are the options that we'll consider? Let's talk through the good, the bad, and the ugly, and let's pick something that fits. And the most comfortable drug you might be okay with might be the um, but might be the Copaxone that you were on in the past. Thank you. Um, this will be our last question. Does having a black holes showing on the MRI mean you are on the path for dementia? No. So let's unpack that a little bit. So when you do an MRI in the setting of MS, you're looking for spots, white spots and black spots and enhancing spots. And typically you're comparing the spots to the last time you did an MRI to see if there's any ones that are new. Now, all people with MS have black holes. If you have no black holes on your scan, I actually challenge the diagnosis. And on average, we wanna have about 10% black holes for all the white spots. We want you know, about less than 10% black spots. If you have black holes, which are also called T1 hypointensities, it's not a good prognostic feature but it does not mean that you are predestined to have dementia, not at all. Now, when I look at an MRI with somebody and I'm looking at the white spots and the enhancing spots, we also look at the black spots to make sure that they're not accruing too many. Um, but having them is ubiquitous amongst people with MS. And no, I do not feel it's a direct path to dementia, not at all. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. So that brings us to the end of our time. If you've missed any part of this conference, it has been recorded and will be available through the MS Focus Facebook and YouTube channels. Reply to your registration email for information on how to access the recordings or just to sign up for our newsletter to learn more about the upcoming events. Our next teleconference will be next Thursday afternoon, February 1st at 3 o'clock p.m. Eastern. Dr. Adam Schaefitz will be presenting Navigating Your MS Care and Tips to Keep You on Course. As you leave the conference today, a survey will appear on your screen. We ask you to please take a moment to give us your feedback on this program and your suggestions for any future topics that you'd like to hear, because really what we're trying to do are, are present you with things that are most meaningful to you and helpful. So our sincere thanks to all of our attendees for your participation and especially to Dr. Boster for sharing his time, knowledge, and a one-of-a-kind personality with all of us. Have a wonderful evening, everyone, and we hope to see you again soon. Be wonderful. Thank you again. God bless. Thank you. Thank you.